Hi, I'm Matt Neverett, play-by-play broadcaster for the Las Vegas Aviators, AAA affiliate of the Oakland Athletics, and play-by-play broadcaster for UNLV Athletics as well. And this is Dingo Talk. You want to know by now. You want to know by now. You want to know by now. You want to know. You want to know. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest, Matt Neverett. Uh, what do we get? UNLV broadcaster, your AAA affiliate for the Oakland A's. Uh, yeah. Matt, you're, you're talking to us from, a, I believe, a press box, correct? Yeah, yeah. I spend most of my life in press boxes uh, coming to you from the uh, press box in Round Rock, Texas. Uh, Round Rock Express, the AAA affiliate of the Texas Rangers. The Aviators uh, on the road, a three-game series, and then we head back to Las Vegas uh, tomorrow. So how long have you been in Vegas? Uh, I was actually, I'm actually originally from Las Vegas. I was born there, lived there until I was about 10. Uh, and then I moved there uh, February of 2020. Perfect timing just for everything to shut down. And uh, every, everything's back to whatever normal is, at least out in Vegas. So it's been, uh, it's been a good three years or so. Well, so after 10 years old, you, uh, you were the, uh, uh, there's a couple of people who've come out of your high school, but I'll call you the pride of Pine Richland. Um, 2012 graduate of Pine Richland. How do you make the decision to find your way to Brook County, West Virginia? Uh, it was mainly just because I wanted to keep playing baseball. I was uh, definitely not the pride of Pine Richland. You are very kind for saying that, but athletically very, very average and, you know, wanted to continue to play baseball at any level, did not necessarily care, you know, definitely wasn't going D1. I had one or two D2 offers, but it was schools far away. I did, you know, wanted to stay somewhat close to home originally. And uh, basically it came down to either Bethany, Clarion or Allegheny College. And uh just with, with what I wanted to do with broadcasting and thinking that I could get in from day one, both on the field baseball wise and uh, in the broadcast booth and getting some opportunities early on, Bethany kind of presented that option for me. Well, and so you have an interesting, and we will get to your, your second part of your college career, but you have a very interesting kind of, you have the background with your dad being a broadcaster, but you also have the option or you, the opportunity where like you said, Bethany, day one, if you want to go into the radio booth, you want to go on the, you want to go on TV, you have that opportunity. Is that the same as when you went off to your second excursion down to App State? Is that the same way that would work? Or had you been a freshman, would you have gotten an opportunity, I guess? If I was at App State as a freshman, definitely not. Uh, it's, you know, bigger Division One school. When I was there, it was about 18,000 undergraduate students. It's a little bit bigger now. It's ballooned up to about 20. But uh, yeah, a lot of my friends who were my same age graduated with me said that when they were freshmen, sophomores, they, they really didn't get a lot of opportunities just because the programs were uh, so much bigger just by default with the, the, the amount of students, the amount of people interested in what's really blossoming into a, one, of the, one of the top broadcasting programs on the East Coast, both on the radio uh, and on the TV side. So I, I was fortunate enough that when I went in as a junior, when it was my third year of college, where I had already had plenty of experience, I kind of got to get in front of the microphone a little bit earlier, but it was solely because I had already had those uh, couple of years of experience. Now, so you're, you're, you're there, you're at Bethany for two years. Let's talk, a, we're going to do a real quick recap of that. So you came in to play baseball. What was college baseball like um, difference wise? What was, what was the biggest difference between high school baseball and then college baseball? Uh, definitely step up on the field. You know, everybody throws harder, everybody's stronger, everybody's faster. You know, it's the D- division three level, which some people, uh, you know, think that, you know, that's just glorified high school ball. I mean, there's legitimate prospects that get drafted out of the division three level every year. And uh, it was really good to be able to kind of just see that difference right away. And I had a, a kind of a unique skill set uh, on the field as far as, you know, definitely a good glove, I would say. And I had a really good, uh, I was really good at bunting, which the, the coach at the time, Rick, Rich Carver, Rick Carver absolutely loved bunting. So I, loved I it. was a deep enough bunter to get in from day one. And I, I kind of stole some starts my freshman year uh, just because I could bunt. <laughs> So you and Michael McHenry share a, share a common thing. He was the best bunter in, in Cardinals history, and you were a solid freshman bunter to get yourself on the field at Bethany. <laughs> hey, not a not a not a sexy uh, skill, but it's I'll I'll take it. It's the little things that get you on the field. Um, so let's talk a little bit uh, social life because you know again you pointed out when you go to App, it's a very much different uh, size and campus. What was social life like for you on the Bethany side? 
definitely interesting. Uh, the uh, Pine Ridge High School, Pittsburgh suburb area, almost 2,000 kids that went there. It's a pretty big school. Uh, Bethany, when I was there, at one point there was under a thousand students there in my in my two years there. So you know, definitely a, a difference there. Uh, you're kind of trapped in in a sense as far as most people that went there. You know, didn't necessarily have a car. There's really unless you're going to Pittsburgh, nowhere to go with your car. Um, yeah. So you you learn to like the people that you're stuck around pretty early on. And fortunately, with athletics, you really have a, a built in support group built in friendship group right off the bat. So, you know, the, the team and your teammates really uh, start to get more accommodated with each other. And it was mm-hmm. interesting too, because you, you hang out around people that you wouldn't normally uh, have associated yourself with otherwise, if you weren't jammed together and, and kind of have forced to hang out, but you know, you, you built some really strong friendships really quickly. And uh, that was definitely one of the, one of the positives. So let's fast forward. We get to 2014 um what makes what what changes in you or why the why the move why leave bethany and and move on a part of it was just the 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 size of the school was looking at uh you know just some some other people in the industry and kind of comparing myself to to others and uh, where where we were in in points of our career it it was part that part i i had a couple of uh injuries i had a shoulder injury i had hurt my elbow uh, really wasn't going to be playing much that year and just really didn't see myself necessarily being part of the uh, the program coming through with some of the new recruits and just just the direction of the program I wasn't necessarily thrilled with and I, I really wanted to at that point you know very average size very you know average to below average skill set on the field I know I'm not going to the big leagues as a player so I kind of took a lesson from my dad who went to uh, Emerson College in Boston which is one of the top communications schools still to this day and one of the lessons that his professor asked them in, in class, one of their first days was, you know, how many of you are going to the big leagues? Nobody raised their hand. How many of you think you may go to the big leagues as a broadcaster? And three or four guys raised their hand. So that's kind of where I uh, got the, the the inspiration to kind of start kicking the tires and uh, looking around. And as I mentioned earlier, really uh, a burgeoning broadcast program at App State. I've got family in the Raleigh area. It's where my mom lives now. Uh, her whole family had always lived there. Um, so I, I had been looking between App State and North Carolina State in that area. I knew I kind of wanted to to kind of get down into that area, look for a bigger school. And again, I knew I wasn't going to go pro, even play at the Division One level. So it was something where I kind of put the athletics in the back burner for the first time in my life and really started focusing on uh, my, my future and what I wanted to do. And I thought Appalachian State kind of presented that, that best opportunity. And I, I don't regret a second of it. Now, let me ask you, because you, you know, broadcasting is, is a, as you point out, your dad's a broadcaster. Uh, He's, he's, for those that don't know, he, he was the voice of the pirates for a little bit. He was the voice of the Red Sox. Um, I'm missing another, there's a team. I know I'm missing at least one. He's with the Dodgers now. So um, was broadcasting from day one, that was coming out of high school. You were just, that was where you wanted to go. You just felt that is that something that you guys kind of bond over or is that more you kind of, you, you saw him doing it, but you also have the love for sports and wanted to stay in it. Yeah. A little bit of both. And I mean, still to this day, we, we connect over the art of broadcasting and the, the love of sports and mainly baseball, but other things as well. But it was something that I had wanted to do from an early age, just kind of being around the industry, being around professional sports, kind of getting to peel back the curtain and, go into the locker rooms, hang out with some of the players. Uh, And and I was fortunate enough that when we moved, I went, I lived in Denver from uh, fourth grade through ninth grade. And when we moved to Pittsburgh after my ninth grade year, uh, was fortunate enough to get involved with the uh, cable TV station at Pine Ridge right away. Uh, So I've been, I was calling women's basketball as a sophomore in high school on, on, on televisions. So it was something that I kind of got started doing at a super young age, even before at high school, just knowing that I had the interest. And then uh, once I got to uh, to Pittsburgh and Pine Ridge and had the television station, then I got involved with early and I, I was hooked. I started right, right away and haven't really stopped. So let's, let's talk about App State a little bit. So you're, you're walking into a program that's, that's kind of every year going up, up, up. Um, what were some of the games you got to call or what was the favorite broadcast that you were a part of at App State? So I got to, uh, involved in the, the student radio station really early on. WASU it, it has won uh, awards for, for its uh, student radio station production and a lot of the sports stuff that they do. So it's, it, it is a, a smaller program compared to a lot of the, the nationally renowned programs like Syracuse, Northwestern, fill in the blank, Arizona State, starting to become one of the bigger broadcast schools. But it, I kind of like that. I had been come, I had come from 
uh, a school that was almost 20 times smaller than that and uh, got, got involved in, in, in it right away and was really, really fortunate that the, the experiences that I had been afforded prior kind of gave me a leg up on some of the, the guys that had, you know, started at 18, 19, whereas I had been doing it for five or six years already. So I got, I got started right away. Um, they really do a good job with the, the football program of obviously they have their national broadcast on Learfield and um, Adam Witten is the guy that does that. He does a great job, but they, they really accommodate the, the student broadcast as well because they know how important it is with everything kind of coming together. And that's a vital part of the development mm -hmm. of the school. Um, I, I would say my favorite game that I did was when Miami came to App State and uh, App State was in the game for about one drive. And uh, they got smoked after that, just absolutely pummeled. But just the fanfare and seeing, you know, App State on the national spotlight, ESPN, it was the, the feature early slot game on ESPN on a Saturday morning. And although the, the Mountaineers got their, you know, behinds handed to them, it was a really, really fun experience. And I, I got to call basketball. I got to call volleyball. We did soccer. I did baseball, softball, both on radio and television there. So it was uh, you know, bigger school for sure, but still a small enough program where from day one, I, I, I got involved right away and uh, never really looked back. So out of App State, you end up going to Birmingham, correct? You end up making yeah. your way down to Birmingham, Alabama. And yeah. so how did that come about? When and, and was that the only job opportunity or where did you have to kind of were you looking at a couple options and Birmingham seemed as if that's the foot I need? I mean, yeah, if, if you know anything about minor league baseball and the way that the, the hiring cycle kind of goes in the offseason, you're usually presented with a, a, a couple of options. Now, not everybody is fortunate enough to have that, that opportunity. And I was even more fortunate to where, you know, I graduated in May of 2017 and I actually had the job locked up by December, January, uh, because okay. it was a position where it was mainly media relations. I was a media relations manager with some broadcast mixed in. So it was something where I was kind of going out of my comfort zone. Uh, Kurt Bloom, who's been the broadcaster in Birmingham for years and years and years, dating all the way back to when Michael Jordan was there in 1994, uh, is a guy that, that, that goes back with my family. My dad used to do a lot of uh, syndicated national sports talk radio uh, way back in the day and kind of struck up a relationship with uh, Kurt Bloom. They call him CB. He's a legend in the minor league game. Uh, from way back. And it was one that was kind of dormant. And when I was looking for jobs, I had reached out to him and he said, oh, hey, you know, I, I, I knew your dad a little bit. They hadn't talked in years. Uh, and then they kind of got to talking. And I think just with the mix of, of my resume and demo and kind of the, the, the endorsement from my dad, which is a, a, you know, personal endorsement, obviously, but a professional endorsement in that, in that regard, someone that he had known and worked with for a long time. Uh, yeah, it was definitely fortunate to wear I had gotten the job in December and I, I was ready to go February, March, when the season started, I was ready to leave school early and, and, and just take off. But CB uh, told me, he said, you know, it's, it's two months, finish your degree, finish out what you're there to start. You, you had to do the extra year for God's sake. So you might as well <laughs> stay there for an extra couple months. Um, you know, stay there, finish up everything. We're still going to be here in May when you're done. So I missed the first about month and a half of the season, but you know, by the time the season ends in September, it, it felt like a, a full season and then some. But it was, that month and a half isn't very much what you're talking about. Exactly. It's all about the long game. And that's something that's one of the many, many lessons that he taught me that summer. He's still a really close friend and a, a personal mentor and professional mentor of mine. Um, but it was a really good opportunity just to be involved with the behind the scenes as far as, you know, talking to players, talking to coaches, kind of seeing how they converse with each other and, yeah, one of the lessons that my dad taught me really early on that I got to really put in that summer more so than than I had ever had before was you, when when you're walking down a hallway, players walking down the other side, you don't want them to see you and go, oh, God, what does this guy want? You know, you know, you, you want to be, you know, courteous, professional. You, you do foster some personal relationships with these guys. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're there to do a job. They're there to do a job. Uh, and that there's a, a right and a wrong way to go about it on, on both ends. So I think that's kind of a lot of what I learned that that summer was the, the right and the wrong way to kind of go about things. And, you know, just seeing things firsthand, you, you, you never really know what you're getting into until you're there. And like I said, it was a really, really great experience. And I, I took a lot from it. So how long are you in Birmingham all the way up? So that would be what, 16 to 20. Then you were there, I know, for, four I years? there for I was I was in Birmingham for about five months. I was there May through September. I ended up going to live with my dad for that off season and then uh, applied for job after job after job. I was the, the last guy eliminated from a position in uh, Winston-Salem with the Dash, which was actually the affiliate below 
uh, the Barrens where I had just been. So I thought that that was one that I, you know, had locked up. I flew out there on my own dime for an interview. And, you know, one thing happened one way or the other. They ended up going with the other guy, you know, good, I was happy for him. And I ended up being fortunate enough to get the job with the, uh, the Bradenton Marauders, the, uh, the Pirates single A team in, uh, in Florida, where I spent the 2018 and 2019 seasons. And that was uh, a kind of a mix of the, the, the job that I wanted and the job that I had just been coming from, where I was the, the main play-by-play -play broadcaster, home and road, all 140 games. But then they also added the responsibility of being the full-time media relations director. So it was kind of the media stuff that I had just been schooled up on and had just learned in the broadcast stuff, which I had been kind of finding ways to incorporate when I was in Birmingham. But being able to kind of merge those two together, it was a lot of work, ton of man hours and a lot of sleepless nights, but I, I wouldn't take it back to the world. That was the, the best training ground possible because I had great bosses too who said, hey, we were on an online stream only as well. So the stakes were low as far as the on-air product. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they didn't give me any direction, which I, I took that as a positive that they, they, they trusted me that I knew, at least I thought I knew what I was doing enough to uh, get to <laughs> develop their trust. But yeah, it was really great to where I, I had kind of free rank, carte blanche to do produce, put out kind of whatever I wanted. And I never heard boo uh, to, to the negative. So it was really, really good experience as far as that's concerned. Now, for those that don't know, that's not the normal for the industry, right? Normally there is somebody that's going to say, hey, we'd like to go this direction or we'd like to go with this on the media side. Whereas when you're in Bradenton and it has to help that you're in Bradenton. So it's not like, it's not terrible weather and it's a beautiful facility. And, uh, but it, that's not normal in the industry, right? You don't normally just kind of get, here's go do make it happen. Yeah. Typically, typically not. I mean, everything in minor league baseball is so, so individual based on each city, each team. Uh, a lot of it is based on who owns the team. And that's something that not a lot of people know is that a lot of these decisions are based on who owns the ball club. And it was mm -hmm. the pirates that owned and still own the Marauders. So, you know, financially, I, you know, I didn't apply or get anything crazy, but if you needed something, you needed a piece of gear that was, you could reasonably accommodate. Yeah. They would go ahead and do it. And I've seen some like in Birmingham, we were owned by the group that owned uh, Bassmasters and a couple other businesses. So it was kind of a private entity. And here in Las Vegas, we're owned by the Howard Hughes Corporation, which is like a multinational real estate conglomerate that's got unlimited pockets. So I've been in, you know, three different places with some with three different uh, setups as far as the ownership. Group. That's one thing that not a lot of people know or take into consideration with these gigs is, you know, where's the money coming from? Who, who are you getting it from? So it was different with the Pirates. And I had built up enough of a rapport with the, with the ball club prior to me even getting there to where they knew that at least I thought I knew what I was doing and it definitely developed and got better over the uh, two seasons that I was there. Well, and then, so is the move to Vegas after those two seasons or is there a stop in there? No. So I, yeah, so the 2019 season ended actually early because there was a, a projected hurricane that canceled the, the Florida state league playoffs that year and they hurricane never, never touched ground. Oh. Uh, I actually was, I had a trip booked up to Pittsburgh coincidentally enough. Uh, after the season ended because we were one of the worst teams in the league that year. We knew we weren't making the playoffs. So I had had the, the, the trip scheduled and had to bump it up a couple of days for this hurricane that was supposed to, you know, it never came. The area. Never touch land. I lived with my uh, brother down there, one of my two younger brothers that also worked for the ball club. And I texted him. I'm like, hey, how's everything going? He goes, it's sunny today. <laughs> so it was, uh, I, got, I got out of there right after that and ended up uh, staying briefly with my dad up in uh, New Hampshire again. And then, uh, I actually had been applying and flew out to Las Vegas in uh, October of 2019 to interview for some jobs, meet some people around town, kind of get the lay of the land. So that trip was definitely fruitful as far as you know, making contacts and following up with that. And uh, I had been in contact with the aviators. Uh, my dad actually had uh, broadcasted for, they were then the Las Vegas 51s way back in the day, I think 2000 one to 2004 the three years that he were there where he was there and it's the, the same ownership group so we went and met he said hey to whoever he was going to say hey to while well, my brother and i sat with the team president and, and hammered out kind of what we were looking to do and uh you know he didn't offer me a, a full-time job out of the gate when i uh, had made the decision to where there was going to be enough individual pieces to kind of put together in las vegas with the aviators being you know kind of kind of chief among them i decided to, to kind of take a, a leap of faith which was something that i hadn't really done in my career yet uh, you mm -hmm. know, still plenty of time to go but I, I had a lot of the opportunities locked up before I was moving uh, so it was something that I didn't take lightly and it was a you know somewhat of a risk and I, I came out with a, a part-time job uh, with with the ball club 
And then I had actually been hired on uh, another part-time job with uh, v- Vizen, Vegas Sports and Information Network, a sports betting TV station out here that's owned by uh, Brent Musburger, actually, and his brother. And uh, I kind of was starting to put those two pieces together. We had uh, four Major League Spring training games at our ballpark in Las Vegas in March of 2020. And then I think everybody knows what, what's coming, what happened next. COVID hit and, uh, <laughs> and shut everything down. So that really stopped a lot of the, the momentum that I had built in the, the two months or so that I had been out in town. Well, so, and let's, let's dive in a little bit to, so how does, how have you gotten back to the, the norm, what is normal, like, or whatever the normal is now? It's uh, it's interesting. So when, when everything got shut down, myself, along with almost everybody else on the planet out of work, you know, both of my jobs had basically said, Hey, you know, whenever, if stuff ever gets back, you know, we're going to likely bring you back. It was a kind of a, fur, not, not, not a technical furlough, but it was kind of a handshake agreement with, with both places. So, you know, kind of hung around for four to five months, got, got un- unemployment through the state government, which was definitely fortunate, ended up kind of keeping me afloat during that time, as well as everybody else, once everybody kind of figured out how to actually get it, because it took forever. But, uh, and I was fortunate enough that these in part out of necessity on their end and part out of me bugging them about it on my end, uh, brought me back for that fall. But what I had also picked up during that summer, because the, the, all the casinos in Las Vegas shut down for the first time, uh, since uh, it was actually since the uh, the JFK assassination in 1963 was the last time that the Vegas casino shut down to this level. So it had, you know, been almost an unheralded event, but I was fortunate enough to use some of the contacts that I had made in that initial trip out in October of uh, the year prior to get a job at behind the counter at the Westgate Superbook, one of the biggest sports books in town. And, you know, sports gambling has always been a, an interest of mine. And you're in the sports betting capital of the world in Las Vegas. I figured why not? And that was actually a really good opportunity to kind of learn a new trade, learn some new terms, meet a different kind of person. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the degenerates or otherwise that hang out at Las Vegas <laughs> sports books all day and night. We're all degenerate but in some way. We're all degenerate for something, but these, it's a different, different class of people for, for better or worse that hang out at these sports books. So you learn to deal with a lot of different type of people working at these sports books. So I basically did that with Westgate and worked part-time as a, a producer and a production assistant at Vizen, uh, producing shows, content, social media, a lot of that stuff. And then the 2021 season last year, I actually was working full-time at Vizen. I, I stopped working at Westgate once baseball started, but it was full-time at Vizen, part-time with the ball club, mainly working, uh, doing a lot of graphics and uh, video board content okay. and kind of filling in on the broadcast on the side and, was really fortunate to have the time and the the physical energy to work two basically full-time jobs. Like when the aviators were in town, I would work 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Vizen and then would, you know, haul over to the ballpark and work the game that night until about 11 and then do it all over the next day. So it was a, a lot of work, was really fortunate that both places were able to accommodate my, my schedule elsewhere and was really, really fortunate this off season to be able to kind of create my own position. They brought me in full-time, uh, it's the uh, game entertainment and marketing specialist is my full-time title, but I, I do a lot of the video board content as well mm-hmm. as far as graphics and video packages. But I'm I'm, I'm calling games, so it's been it's been a lot of fun. Well, and, and so how does you on how does UNLV factor into that as well? So I got I got started actually in uh, the spring of 2020 as well with that doing the baseball. They, re- they have an online video stream for their baseball. So I got started with that, just kind of worked my way in there. And then by the time that winter had rolled around, they wanted to be able to put out some of the basketball games, both on the men's and the women's side, on a local uh, cable station through Cox. And I uh, was fortunate enough to be able to be the guy that they selected among a, a couple other people locally to to call those games. So that, that first year I did basketball, I did uh, probably 15 baseball games before everything shut down. And that that winter, I think seven or eight basketball games between the men and the women's side. And then that's kind of developed to where this year I did every home game for UNLV uh, baseball. And then uh, this past winter, I think I did about 20 to 25 games between the men and the women all on uh, local television. So that's something that's kind of growing and developing. And I, I anticipate that kind of burgeoning throughout the year as well. The grind doesn't stop, huh, buddy? Exactly, right? So let's, let's, uh, for those, the kids that are, or the students, I guess, that are getting ready to graduate, or maybe they're, let's call them sophomores. Let's, let's go with the year that you decide to transfer out. And uh, what, what advice would you give them? What advice would you give somebody like me or you that, yeah, we like, we like sports. We want to, we want to be involved in this profession. 
but where, where do they start? What do they do? I would say, first off, you got to be prepared to work a lot. You got to be prepared to work hard, work long hours. Uh, if you want to work in baseball, there is crazy travel involved. So that's, you got to be comfortable traveling. I would say the main thing though, that uh, I, I kind of learned maybe even a little bit too late, but definitely through experience is don't be afraid to reach out to people. Um, don't be afraid to hear no is another big one that I was told earlier because you, you will be told no way more than you're told yes. Um, and it's just a matter of having the self-confidence in yourself and your abilities and and what you want to do in the future as far as not being afraid to, to rebound from that. You have to be able to apply to a bunch of different jobs. I would go to the, the baseball winter meetings every year for a three-year stretch in a row and apply for probably 20 to 30 jobs a year, whether it be broadcasting or otherwise. And I, I got zero job offers mm -hmm. when, it, when it came down to the end of the day from those three years of going. So I got told no a bunch of times. And it was uh, a humbling experience for sure, but it's one that I think I'm, I'm really glad that I learned early on is don't be afraid to, uh, don't be afraid to hear no is what it comes down to, but don't be afraid to celebrate the yeses as well, because when the, these jobs are really hard to get, especially in baseball, they're, they're few and far between. So you definitely have to consider, consider yourself really fortunate uh, if you are lucky enough to, to impress someone enough to get, to get a job, whether it's baseball or otherwise, there are a million people who would cut off an arm to, to, to do what I do. And I, I, I'm fortunate and I definitely don't take anything for granted. And that's, well, I would say the main thing is don't be afraid to hear no. Don't be afraid to celebrate the yeses either though. And then for the portfolio folk out there that are trying to build their portfolio, what are things that maybe you used in your, in your portfolio or your demo that you found you didn't need and maybe something that you didn't or that you didn't include, but you need it? Well, I would say one thing before even that, and that's something, again, that I learned through experience is, number one, record everything. Get recordings of everything. If you have to record it yourself, find a way. That's I, I record my own broadcast through, through our board here. Uh, you have to record everything, and then you have to be able to listen to your own voice. People, a lot of people, especially those that are not in the industry, not broadcasters, say, oh, I hate listening to my own voice. You're not afforded that luxury in this, in this industry, because you're not going to, unless you're a major league guy with big money and really big prestige, you're going to be cutting your own demo reel. You're not going to be mm -hmm. able to send a bunch of tape over to someone and say, hey, pick the best stuff and send it over to me. So that's that, that, that's the big one right off the bat is record everything. Uh, don't be afraid to listen to your own voice because you're going to you're going to have to. Um, I, I would say if you're applying for jobs, tailor your demo, your application, your resume, tailor them to the specific job that you want. Yeah, if I'm applying for a soccer job, they don't care that I can do baseball on the radio. That no. doesn't, almost nothing applies from what I'm doing here in baseball to, you know, a major league soccer broadcast. So mm -hmm. you, you've got to be able to curtail your demos to the jobs that you're applying for. And it's something that, you know, you don't necessarily need to press play and they immediately hear you screaming and doing a bunch of crazy calls right off the bat. It's something they, they want to hear how you get in and out of breaks. They want to hear how you promote the sponsors. And then they want to hear how you describe the action, especially mm -hmm. on radio. The, ra the difference between TV and radio is, is big in some, some sports, for sure. Baseball is one of them where on, on, on radio, you're the voice of the blind. You know? you're, you're describing the action. You're painting the picture. You're talking about the weather. You're talking about the sky. You're talking about the fan on the field. Uh, whereas on TV, you're just kind of more having a conversation and narrating kind of what's going on in the background. Um, so I, I would say, yeah, just really don't be afraid to hear your own voice and then definitely personalize your, your, your demo reels for, for the jobs or the sports that you're applying for. Well, Matt, we have come to that point. I know you have a busy schedule on your hand. I, we, we don't have a busy schedule here. I got to go to bed and go to work tomorrow, but, uh, I want to say thank you for taking the time, uh, on this road trip to, to join us. Uh, for those of you at home, if you're just joining us, go back to the beginning. Matt said a bunch of good things, and this is the end of the show, so you should go back. Uh, but you can find us on YouTube, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and Wisdom. The only place you can't type in Dingo Talk is Instagram. It's Dingo underscore talk, because believe it or not, somebody has the Dingo Talk as oh my their, God. and it's all about dingoes. So oh, don't look that one up. I'm not there. Matt won't be there. None of us will be there. Don't find, don't go look at that one. Um, at least literal interpretation. <laughs> uh, Matt, thank you again for taking the time. It's always good. It's been a while since we got to catch up. So I'm glad to, it's good to see you. And uh, we'll be back next week, Chuckleheads. You want to know by now. You